So we're going to start off by introducing DeepLake's open source component, uh, formerly known as Active Loop Hub. DeepLake is its latest version that has been super optimized and rewritten in C++ and actually sped up the data streaming by two times uh, as compared to the previous DeepLake versions, as well as uh, when compared to other uh, PyTorch data loaders out there as verified by an independent study of Yale researchers. So DeepLake open source helps you build, manage, a version control, filter, and visualize data sets for AI. We're focusing on image, video, and audio data. And more importantly, we're letting you to stream your data real time while training ML models in PyTorch or TensorFlow. So let's gonna go ahead and look how this works. So what we're gonna do now is see how this works in action. Um, I'm gonna pip install DeepLink and then solve a problem with you know, data access and fast loading. So uh, with DeepLake, I am able to load data sets either from local file path or an S3 or Google Drive or even Active Loop Cloud. Well, we have a bunch of pre-upload data sets there in DeepLake format. I'm gonna go ahead and just load Amnist, one of the most popular data sets out there. So there we go, Amnist loaded in um, under one second. Let's see, um, you can say Amnist is pretty small, how does this fare against larger data sets? So I'm gonna try to load Leon. Leon is one of the largest data sets out there, um, as David has mentioned, and we're gonna load it. And it worked in under two seconds there. Um, the way we're able to achieve this um, in this case is we also, not only do we stream the data, but we also uh, store, the, store the URLs to the specific images and we're able to materialize the data set on the fly. And thanks to the DeepLake format that's uh, resembling a multi-dimensional NumPy-like array, um, I'm also able to interface with the data set to kind of manipulate it as if it was an array. So I'm just going to go ahead here and retrieve the first image. Once we loaded the data set, we can visualize it. So, so basically, let's say I've loaded Coco. Um, I'm able to go ahead and visualize it with all its metadata. And metadata is uh, just another tensor or another column um, in the data set. So it's all stored in one place. Uh, not only image data sets, but also video data sets. Let's see here, uh, this is a person running in, uh, you know, low light conditions. And also let's say uh, audio data sets. So here we go, we have some smooth jazz here. Finally, what we want to be doing obviously is resolving that data to compute handoff bottleneck. And here, I'm gonna show you how DeepLake interfaces with frameworks like PyTorch and TensorFlow. In this case, let's try to load the Cypher data set and then write a simple transform function and the data loader. So the data loader is gonna be ds.pytorch. And then just what we're gonna do is we're just gonna iterate through um, the data loader. Finally, for the purpose of this uh, Python demo, what we're going to do is we're going to look at data set version control and a very important feature for data centric AI workflows. Uh, and DeepLake offers you to uh, manage your uh, data sets and man manage changes to your data sets uh, and, and save them as your data set evolves, uh, just like in Git. So basically, you're able to use your favorite functions such as commit, log, branch, checkout, diff, um, and Evo is actually going to take over and show how to kind of combine all the features of DeepLake together for data-centric workflows um, and how these features actually shine the most through the UI. Here we are visualizing the Coco dataset that we just uploaded. Now, if we click on the version control pill here, we see that this dataset has three commits. And currently we're on the very first commit, which is the one right after the dataset was uploaded. Now let's run our query where we down select the data based on the classes that are of interest. And so the query has already executed. Now if we check out the very first sample in this query result, we see that we have a stop sign here that is labeled as a stop sign and it probably is in fact a stop sign, but since the face of the sign is not present, it's unlikely that a computer vision model will identify it correctly and so we chose to remove this label from the, stops, from the um, sample. And another edit that we choose to make is that this sample right here it's just a very low quality image. It's, it's black and white and has a very low resolution. And then all of these objects that are labeled um, with uh, these traffic lights and this car here, there's actually very low certainty about these labels. Like this may or may not be a car. And then same thing with these two traffic lights and this one in the distant background. And so we chose to delete um, this sample as well. And with every modification that we made, we created another um, commit on the data set.
And so if we cancel this query, let's actually go to one of the new commits. So this latest one um, will contain both of the edits that we just talked about. So now if we run our query again, we're running the exact same query, except now on a version of the data set after our edits. We see that this very first sample, the stop sign is, is no longer labeled. And then uh, index 61 is no longer present. So the sample we deleted would have been in these two, between these two images, and it's no longer here. And so subsequent work in our training will take place on this particular version of the data set, which is essentially the latest commit. Active Loop offers a variety of immensely powerful tools for slicing and dicing your data and then training models on those results. So here we're looking at the COCO dataset, which is a very popular computer vision dataset, and let's run a query on it. So we click on Run Query here. This takes SQL style syntax, so I'm going to paste this query where we select images that contains cars, buses, and trucks, and we limit the results to 1,000 of each. And with Shift Enter, I can execute the query, and here are the results. We'll see lots of images of motor vehicles. Now most importantly, I can save the query result. And then once the result is saved, I can see it in the query history. There it is right there. And I can then copy this ID and actually use the ID to load the query result in Python in order to train a model. So let's do that next. Now we're in Python and we load the data set using hub.load and then we load the view by running ds.loadView and passing in the ID from the UI. Now we have a data set view that's ready for training and we can pass that to .pytorch to get a PyTorch data loader and then we simply pass that data loader into a training script. And please check out our docs for tons of examples for training different models. Here we are visualizing the VizDrone training data set in the ActiveLoop UI and we see this data set has about 6,500 samples. Now unfortunately a lot of the samples look like the one here, where the annotations of the objects are extremely tiny, so these cars are really far in the distance and this is something that's not very relevant for our application and it's also extremely hard for object detection models to be trained on this type of data. And so let's filter it out. So what we can do is in this query engine, we can use our SQL style query language combined with this NumPy style logic to filter out all the images that contain any, any objects of label car that have either the width or the height less than 20. Now we could get more elaborate here on the query that we run, but most images contain cars, and so simply filtering based on cars alone and their size is a good proxy for distance from the camera. And so let's run that query. So we see that there are still certain cases where the cars are fairly small, but the problem is not nearly as pronounced as it was before. In general, the smallest objects, or rather the samples containing the really small objects at a far distance have been eliminated. And we see that now we have about 3,000 samples that met the query condition, so about half of the data has been eliminated. And now when we've run this query, we can click on Save Query Result. And then if we look at the query history, we can copy and paste this query ID, and then we'll load that in Python API and then train a model based only on the data that met this query condition. And then we repeat the exact same process for our validation data set in terms of filtering out the small samples. Now let's look at the testing data set that we use to evaluate the quality of the model predictions. So again, first we switch to the training run branch. And then let's go to full screen to have a better view of the data. As you can see here, there's a lot of bounding boxes here, and so it's a little tricky to differentiate um, which ones are the predictions and which ones are the labels. And so to do that, we go to the visualization settings, we go to the model evaluation group, open up the bounding boxes, and then we select the bounding box style to be dotted. And so now the solid lines are our ground truth, and the dotted bounding boxes are the model predictions. And if we sort the predictions based on IOU, let's um, go to first the uh, highest IOU predictions. We see that in some cases, the model is actually making the right prediction. So it got this five pretty correctly. It got this three also quite accurately. Like when there's these very clear um, single digit um, annotations, the model does a pretty good job of making the right predictions. Now let's actually sort it in the reverse order when the lowest IOU is first. So here now we see quite a few examples of where the model struggled. So let's go through these in more detail. So this one appears to be both potentially mislabeled and also these numbers are not very clear even for a human and they're also very small. For this one, um, the, the data is um, flat out misannotated. So the one is labeled as a five, the five is labeled as a six. So actually the model here was more correct um, than the annotation. So this would be something that we might want to delete from the validation data set. And so again, this is really useful because you can use the tool to go over your data and try to understand what are the areas where your model succeeds and when does it fail in order to either fix um, the images where the model might be failing or potentially to add more representative values where the model is struggling in order to make it predict um, more accurately under those circumstances.